Hello, hello, and welcome to Lesson 6 for Unit 3, Area Study 1, where we're looking at microeconomics in the new study design. Today, we're going to be looking at price elasticity of supply and demand, which is where demand starts to get a little bit more complicated, and supply does too, than we've been looking at previously. So previously, we've been looking at supply and demand as if they are these really nice, clean 45 degree lines. And today, we're going to look at when they get a little bit more steep or a little bit more flat and what that means overall. So our key knowledge for today is the meaning and significance of price elasticity of demand and supply. And then the factors that affect price elasticity of demand, so degree of necessity, availability of substitutes, and proportion of income and time. And the factors that affect price elasticity of supply, which include spare capacity, production period, and durability of goods. So as we're doing all along, our learning intention is to understand how resources are allocated in Australia. Most specifically today, we're going to be looking at how our numerical or our money resources or our supply is impacted or allocated and how that allocation changes based on changes in price and how that impacts quantity. So our success criteria is that you can describe price elasticity of demand and supply. You can apply factors that impact price elasticity of supply because that's incredibly important in short answer questions and on the end of year exam. And that you can explain how changes in elasticity impact price and quantity. It's really important whenever you talk about elasticity in answers that you talk about how both price and quantity are impacted and how they relate. All right, so despite the nice, clean 45 degree angle line we most often have in supply and demand diagrams, that's not always the case. Like in some cases, the pr effect price has on quantity can be much greater or much lesser for supply or demand. So we refer to this as elasticity, which is the responsiveness of quantity supplied or demanded to a change in price and it's a change in the selling price. So when we've been looking at things in the past, we've been saying that basically if price changes by 10%, we've been saying that quantity would change the same, whether that be an expansion or a contraction, we've been saying that, but that's not always the case. Sometimes price might change by 5% and it might change the quantity demanded by 20%. And that can happen for a variety of different reasons. There are also other products where the price may change by 50% and demand might only go down by 5%. And we'll look at reasons for that as we go through. So with elasticity of demand, we have various, what is going on here? So now we get into the specifics of elasticity of demand. So there are three main types of elasticity. There's elastic demand, unilastic demand, and inelastic demand. You'll only ever really use elastic demand or inelastic demand as unilastic is purely theoretical because there's rarely a product where the change in price is exactly the same as the change in quantity. So when we look at elastic demand, it is basically this um, curve up the top over here where, and I'll draw a line or an arrow pointing to it, basically where it's flatter a small change in price. So if we have a price over here, so we have P1 and P2, and we dot them out, you can see that a small change in price has led to a relatively larger change in quantity demanded. Call it elastic. So where a change in price will lead to a larger change in quantity demanded. So for example, if price was to decrease by 10%, quantity demanded might increase by 20%. Unilastic, like I was saying before, exactly the same. If price changes by 10%, quantity demanded increases by 10%. With that, that's probably never going to come up unless it's purely theoretical or you get a multiple choice question where it's a scenario and the ratio is the same. Then we've got inelastic demand, which is where a change in price will lead to a relatively smaller change in quantity demanded. So that's our curve over here. We've got it over here, it's a bit steeper overall. So if we look at two different prices, so we've got P1 and P2, we have a small a large change in price. We'll say let's say with the increase in price. So let's say it went from P2 to P1. You can see that if we have over here Q1 and Q2, it has led to a relatively smaller change in quantity demanded from that change in price. So if price changes by 10%, quantity demanded might only decrease by 5%. So let's look at the factors that impact that overall. So with this, all right, so next up, we've got our factors impacting elasticity of demand. So these are all going to impact whether or not things are elastic or inelastic. So we're going to start to ignore um, unilastic for a little while. We're going to have inelastic on this side and elastic on the other side. 
So we're gonna have a nice steep demand curve here. And on this side, we are going to have a nice flat one. And then we're gonna talk about how these factors impact them. So these four factors, which are degree of necessity, availability of the substitutes, proportion of income and time, are the only four that VCAR can specifically ask you about as they are listed in the study design. So they're also the best ones you should use in questions they're asking to talk about a factor that might impact the elasticity of demand for a specific product, as they are going to be the best ones to name drop and then describe how that would impact whether something's going to be more elastic or more inelastic. So our first one is the degree of necessity. So what the degree of necessity means is basically is, some, is something a need or a want? So our description here is that when things are necessities, for example, water or electricity, they're going to be more inelastic in demand. So when water or electricity goes up in price, people don't really stop demanding much of it because they need it. They need it to survive. Therefore, they're gonna keep buying it. Whereas things that are luxuries, so anything you do not need is gonna be more elastic in demand as when the price changes a little bit, you might buy a whole lot more. So a good example of that is if you go to the supermarkets and a junk food that you like is suddenly on sale, you might buy a whole lot more of it because it's now cheaper. One of my favorite examples of this is when I first started dating my now wife, um, my father-in-law, for some reason, hot dogs were half price at Woolworths or Coles and he bought two kilos of them. There is no rational reason for buying two kilos of hot dogs other than them being elastic in demand and a relatively large change in price led to a exponentially bigger increase in quantity demanded by him. So that's degree of necessity. Next up, we've got availability of substitutes. So that means how many substitutes are available for that product. If there are a lot of substitutes available, it is more likely to be elastic because when the price changes, you'll just jump over to another substitute and pay for that instead. So the price goes up a little, demand goes down a lot. Whereas if there's not a lot of substitutes available, it's going to be more inelastic in demand because in that case when the price goes up you're going to have to buy it anyway because you don't have any other options iphones work like this a lot for some reason apple even though there are many phones available tends to have almost a monopoly over the phone market in how they operate and behave because people are loyal to apple products and therefore because they don't see other phones as being a substitute for them they will keep demanding them even when the price goes up so the price of iphones going up to like two thousand dollars now has only decreased the demand a little bit. Then we have the proportion of income. So goods and services which take a large portion of income tend to be more elastic. So as you will tend to wait for the price to drop to make a purchase. This is true of things like housing, assets, anything that's gonna be considered wealth. Um, as if house prices go down, suddenly the demand for housing is going to go up a whole lot because they're more elastic because they take up a large proportion of your income. Whereas when goods and services cost very little, so the example here is toothpicks, they tend to be inelastic because even if they increase in price, it's not gonna make a large impact. So if a toothpick goes from what, like a few cents to five cents, it's not really gonna make an impact on you overall and therefore it won't really impact your demand that much. And the last one is time. If you need something now, it is going to be inelastic in demand because you have to pay for it regardless. Whereas if you can wait for the price to change, it will be more elastic. So I always like to think of flights when I'm looking at time. Once I was in Queensland for a race and my flight got canceled and I needed to be home the next day for work. So I had to just pay whatever price was available for a flight that night. And therefore, no matter how high the price was going, my demand was inelastic because my quantity demand was gonna stay the same regardless of prices rising. Whereas if I wanted to book a flight next year, I can wait for the price to change. So it's gonna be more elastic because I can wait for prices to drop and then I'll demand a whole lot more flights in the future. So in the short term, things are inelastic. In the long term, they are elastic. Now moving on to, now moving on to elasticity of supply. So with supply, it's fairly similar. It's just about quantity supplied rather than quantity demanded. So we've got three very similar um, pictures over to the side here where we have elastic supply, which is the flatter curve, Unilastic, which is the 45 degree exactly exact ratio curve, and inelastic, which is the steeper curve, which just means as prices rise, businesses struggle to supply a whole lot more. So as we go through these, elastic supply is when a change in price will lead to a larger change in quantity supplied. So if price decreases by 10%, so quantity supply decreases by a larger proportion, so in this case, 20%. And you see that on the diagram up here, if we decrease the price from P1 to P2, you can see that the quantity supplied is going to drop a whole lot. 
because it is elastic in supply. Inelastic is going to be the same, whereas with inelastic, if we see a decrease in price for supply, so we can have a large decrease in price and we'll have a relatively smaller decrease in quantity supplied because it is inelastic there. So elastic supply, where a change in price will lead to a larger change in quantity supplied, and inelastic supply, where a change in price will lead to a relatively smaller change in quantity supplied. So it's going to be really important here is the factors to explain elasticity of supply. So the three of them are if there is spare capacity. So if there is spare capacity, things are going to be more elastic. So if businesses are not using their resources to their maximal potential, supply tends to be more elastic as businesses will be able to recruit extra resources if prices rise and produce more very, very quickly. So that's going to be elastic in supply if there is spare capacity. If there is no spare capacity, we're going to have a situation where supply is going to be inelastic because businesses, even if the prices rise, they're going to struggle to produce any more in the short term. Our next one is production period. So production period is about how long that good or service takes to make. So fruit, vegetables, etc., tend to be more inelastic because it takes a long time to produce them because you've got to grow them, you need the land, etc. So in the short term, things like fruit and vegetables tend to be inelastic because you are going to have to wait for them to grow. And therefore, in the short term, you can't respond to those price changes. Whereas when um, things can be made quickly, they tend to be more elastic. So services can often be elastic because you can quickly recruit more staff to provide more of those services. And that production period doesn't take very long. And our last point for elasticity of supply is durability. So what durability is all about is that good, if goods and services can be stored, so I always think of like tin goods, um, businesses are able to keep stock in storage and respond quickly to increases in price. So if the price of baked beans goes up, businesses can just pull them out of a warehouse and supply a whole lot more of them. Whereas perishable goods like fruit and vegetables, etc., tend to be inelastic as there's a limited window they can be sold for. So if the price of bananas goes down, businesses can't really stop supplying as many bananas because they can't take them off the shelves because they'll just go bad. So they're just going to sell what they've got there. So perishable goods tend to be inelastic, whereas durable goods or storable goods tend to be elastic. And that is everything for elasticity of demand and supply. Hope this is helpful. As always, any questions, shoot them below in the comments or email me, sean at therunningeconomy.com. We've got one more video to make for this topic, which is all about market failure. Um, and then there will be a separate video for government failure, which is already in the playlist. So on that, I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.